Fennell from the Future Tense program at RN, and Radio National is delighted to be partnering this event here in Brisbane tonight. Today's discussion springs from GOMA's current exhibition entitled Harvest, Art, Film and Food, an examination of contemporary issues and ideas around those edible things that keep us alive, both physically and culturally. The exhibition includes over 150 works from the gallery's collection, including paintings from as far back as the 17th century, as well as contemporary photography, video works and dramatic large-scale installations. Goma Talks is interactive, so welcome to all of those joining tonight's proceedings via our live webcam. And if you want to have your say, remember you can tweet a question or comment to the panel by using the hashtag hashgomatalks or by sending an SMS to 04888talks. That's 04888talks and that hashtag again is hashgomatalks. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Now, let me introduce our guests for this panel session this afternoon or this evening. They are Dr Carol Richards, a food and agricultural sociologist from QUT, the Queensland University of Technology. And Carol is a senior research fellow. She's also the vice president of the Australian Food Sovereignty Alliance, a fair food organisation. Our second guest is Tony Ma, and Tony is the general manager of policy and a manager of economics and trade at the NFF, the National Farmers Federation. And until just a few years ago, he was Director of Sustainable Development at the Australian Food and Grocery Council. Our third guest is Dr Jazz Hee-Jeong Choi. And Jazz is the Deputy Director of the Urban Informatics Research Lab at QUT, the Queensland University of Technology. And finally, let me introduce a man with a very personal relationship with food. He's QA Goma's Executive Chef, Josh, Josh Lopez. And let me just mention that Josh uh, will be a delegate representing Slow Food Australia at the forthcoming international slow food gathering in Turin in Italy in late October, as I understand it. Yeah, that's right. So join me in giving them a round of applause. <laughs> Welcome to you all. Just before we get going, let me briefly set the scene. In the second decade of the 21st century, food is everywhere. It dominates our popular culture like never before. And yet in this new millennium, society is arguably far more removed from the realities of food production than at any time in human history. Food today comes packaged and primped without any of the messy realities of the paddock or the abattoir or slaughterhouse as it's also known. And while we've become extremely good at producing ever larger amounts of food, we've also become very good at wasting it. So how do we adjust our attitudes how do we ensure future supplies without destroying the environment or the central place of food as a source of culture and delight? And Josh, I'd like to start the conversation with you tonight. Leaving aside issues of nutrition for a moment, how crucial is having a healthy understanding and relationship with food in maintaining the future emotional and psychological health of a society like ours in Australia? Um, well, I'd like to start off by saying that... Um you know, uh, this question that you've asked me wouldn't even have been a question 100 years ago. I feel that uh, there's been a m massive shift in, uh, in just knowledge and understanding where food comes from. And uh, so to, to really have this discussion, you, you know, is a real great shame, really. So, um, yeah, for, for me, you know, just having these understandings is um, absolutely pivotal. And, uh, and as a chef, I feel a massive, um, almost like an advocacy uh, role where I have to you know, talk where I have to share where the food comes from and, uh, you know, create a relationship, a tie back to the land. Um, yeah, again, you know, all this stuff would have been funny 100 years ago, but, yeah, we, we've really got to get back to, you know, creating that connection. Because that connection between the country and the city, it, it's not what it was even, uh, even 30, 40 years ago, is it? No, absolutely not. And, um, and, and things are getting better. I think, um, you know, we come to almost a almost like a, a critical point where unless we do something about it, um, you know, there's going to be some serious consequences. And I don't mean that in any loose, uh, loose terms and I'm not trying to mince words either. So, um, yeah, it's, it's absolutely pivotal. Our, f our televisions, uh, magazines, websites, they're packed full of food-related images, programs and articles. But do we really, and on the surface of it, that seems good. But do we really value food as a society or, or has food simply become a fetish? Is it yet just a, a, another form of entertainment? No, exactly. And, um, and this goes to the topic of uh, first world problems. 
you know, having food in, in magazines, you're, you're certainly not going to, you know, try sending that question out to someone hungry in, in Africa. You know, yes, that's a bit of a cliche, but, you know, it's glamorising food and, you know, creating all, all the term food porn. You know, first world absolute problems and, uh, and it really detracts from the actual point of food. And uh, yes, it, it is nourishment, but um, it's uh, a status symbol. It's also, you know, cultural identity and, um, you know, absolutely uh, important, um, you know, topic. So, Carol Richards, your perspective. I mean, how, how is it that we can, as an educated society, embrace food, embrace it, its beauty and its desirability and, and yet be so wasteful of it? Because we waste a huge amount of what we produce every year, don't we? We waste probably something um, in the vicinity about 40% of food across the supply chain. That's within and Australia? Oh, yeah, I would say, again, talking about the, fir the first world, with, within places like Australia where we can waste food. But th there's also a misnomer about this as well. There's been a lot of criticism about people overbuying or wasting food from their fridges, but there's a lot of waste along the food supply chain um, from basically, you could say, from farm to fork as well. So um, quite a, a number of complex reasons for that, but um, one of the key culprits has been the private standards by major supermarket chains. So if you've only got basically two buyers of food, they, they set the standards. And we've, um, I mean, fetishism is a really good word. We have this fetish with perfect, you know, cosmetically complete food mm. that looks fantastic and it's marketable, uh, but it's kind of a, a hollow form of food. You know, we need to think about the nutrition, the quality, the non-tradable values of food, like, you know, good returns for farmers, uh, good nutrition for eaters, the whole supply chain of food, but the food waste is a really good place to start. Now, now talking about uh, the look of food, I saw an article just recently, a couple of days ago, actually, on a website. It was a, a, an American magazine, I think it was in New York, and the, the headline of the story was and it had a misshapen pear. Uh, well, I suppose it wouldn't be misshapen, depends on how you <laughs> look at it, but the, the, the headline was, why won't New Yorkers eat this pear? Mm. Uh, you know, yeah. the, the idea being that people won't eat anything that doesn't now, doesn't now fit a kind of stereotype of what a certain type of food should look like. Yeah, I, I think we're on the cusp of some change with these issues. I think um, you know, credit goes to a number of fair food organisations. Um, Brisbane-based Food Connect, for example, the youth food movement, are actually starting campaigns about ugly food. And it's about making that reconnection. Making, you making, know? <laughs> making ugly food a virtue. Ugly, ugly virtue. food is ugly food's the new black. You know, we're starting to look at food in a different way. That it shouldn't be so perfect. If it's perfect, then we have to ask why. There's a lot of fertilizers, pesticides, chemicals that go into making that food look so perfect. It's not how nature intended it to look. I don't think. Is the way we worship food in in pop culture and 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 in a media sense is that is it really any different in a way from the way we worship celebrity? or the way we worship high fashion. I mean, yeah. has, has food in the 21st century, has it really just become, I guess, a, another uh, obsession that can be manipulated by commercial interests? I think part of the problem is we don't actually think about it enough. We take it for granted, um, it's convenient, it's fuel rather than food. So it's quite easy to, you know, to be uh, time poor, dash home to the supermarket, just buy what's on the shelf and not really give too much thought about the supply chain, the people that's involved. And this is part of the disconnect that Josh is mentioning, you know, that mm. we've, uh, we, the supply chains have become quite lengthy, food is quite globalised, it's very easy to be disconnected from the origins of that food and the meaning of it in our lives. We can take it for granted because we, we have that uh, the luxury of being able to waste food and not think too much about it. Tony Ma from the National Farmers Federation. Uh, you represent the Australian farming sector, and the, the fact that food is now so much a part of our cultural, cultural makeup, I mean, that must be a good thing for farmers because it cr increases the demand for their produce. But do you, do you see a widening division between the people who produce our food and the people who are consuming that food? Is, is that a, a real and relevant thing for the Australian farming sector? Yeah, you know, I think it is. I think, um, you know, probably 50 years or so ago, um, you know, people in, in the cities knew someone or they had a relative or someone that was on the farm and they visited a farm. What we're seeing is that real disconnect between consumers and where their food comes from. And there's a real gap and a, and, uh, a misunderstanding in some cases, but a lack of information on what pathway their food took to actually get to them and you know that understanding of where the basics like milk and bread and and protein come from um, we think that there needs to be more effort from industry and from government and from you know um, universities and schools to actually educate people and it's got to start 
really at the at the junior level. So you know, children, young age, primary school age, to to get them to understand where their food comes and recognise agriculture and recognise the things that you know the processes that food has to go through. Um, before they consume it. Now that's quite an amazing thing really, isn't it? Considering how important agriculture is uh, for Australia, for our economy, it's, it's part of our history, it's part of uh, you know, what shaped our national identity. The fact that we, as you say, uh, there's not, we don't talk about it much, we don't talk about food and where it comes from and the land and the rural sector in the way, even the, the idea of the country in the way that perhaps we did. Uh, previously in schools? Yeah, I mean, things have changed and, and um, you know, Australia used to ride on the sheep's back and now it rides on the, um, on the minerals back or the, uh, the dump trucks back. But, um, you know, it, there has been that change in, in economic drivers in rural communities and regional centres aren't as focused on agriculture as perhaps they were when they're more focused on services now and, and people have left, you know, the rural community. So they are tending to die out. Um, but there still is a, a big place and I think there will always be a place for the family farm. Um, I think what we need to do is just build those bridges between the community and the farmer um, so that we've got that trust in food and the trust in the sector and the perception of, of where food comes from and fibre for that matter. We've got a couple of tweets that have come through. Uh, one backing up what we were saying before. Somebody has tweeted, uh, where is it? Sorry, I've lost my place there. 40% uh, of food in Australia is wasted and most of this is along the supply chain a lot due to the desire for perfect food. Somebody else, uh, at Change Agent 2, has posted, uh, like the movie, I think it's Wally, I'm not familiar with that movie, we are eating ourselves into destruction and affluence is alluring us into oblivion. Jazz, <laughs> on that point, let me come to you. Um, your research focuses on the urban environment. Mm -hmm. Urbanisation is often touted as one of the major determinants of our relationship with food. Cities, it said, living in cities, it said, makes it harder for us to connect with the realities of food production. But our modern technologies, our modern digital technologies, they're all about connection, aren't they? Mm -hmm. So how, how can we and how are we using those technologies uh, to overcome that divide between city and country where it comes to food and, and food production? Um, on that note, I think food fetishism is not necessarily bad, um, especially for, well, um, I come from Seoul. I was born in Seoul, South Korea. I had no connection with urban environments. Where, uh, sorry, <laughs> that's silly. Um, rural environments um, and where food comes from, for example. But you know, for urban folks like me, uh, food fetishism is a great starting point to actually look into you know other things. For example, rice and rice could be a problematic topic uh, in terms of agriculture, in terms of its resource intensivity. Um, but also, if I start from sake. Uh, because of my interest in drinking sake and, you know, really develop interest into that area and go, okay, what makes the difference in the taste of sake? And go into rice and go into water and the importance of the, the purity of water and where it comes from, then I can really get into, you know, more sort of areas of knowledge that I wasn't interested in uh, necessarily in the first place. So I think food, food fetishism could be a great starting point for sure. And technology obviously plays an important role in connecting people to other other people who are interested in um, similar areas and also knowledge. And, and we are seeing uh, we are seeing websites, uh, more websites around food and understanding food and, and where it comes from. And we're also seeing people using mobile technologies, aren't we, in, in different ways to try and build those kind of connections. Mm -hmm. um, I think, could we actually go back to one of the questions that was sure. posted at the start? What about emergence of eating alone? I think technologies play <coughs> such an important role in that. and. I think we have to think about the emergence of a, a historically unique uh, phenomenon of um, one-person households in urban environments. Um, in 10 to 15 years, um, including Australia, a lot of developed countries will have 30 to 40 percent of single-person households. You know, um, and eating alone could be a new social phenom phenomenon, and it's growing already. So technologies also play an, play an important role in sort of in, in terms of social dining and that kind of thing where people come together to eat together um, or share knowledge about food, that kind of thing. And commensality obviously that's missing in single person households can be sort of, you know, um, supported by technologies. That's interesting, isn't it? Because the ideal, I guess, of food culture hmm. uh, doesn't really encompass that idea of eating alone. Yeah. 
or being by yourself when you eat, or, or indeed even, like for most of us, I suppose, eating our lunch at our desk. Mm. Now, not even going out to a restaurant or even going to a park or going to a quiet place to, to eat, but just eating there in front of your monitor. Uh, there is a very interesting phenomenon, and it's covered by a lot of websites and media, actually, in South Korea, where I come from, um, called Eatcast, or mukbang in Korean, um, where because of this rise in single-person households and eating in front of the monitor, um, there are webcasts um, of people just eating alone and eating a lot of food. It's just complete fetish. And, you know, you would order food uh, because delivery is a <laughs> core um, dining culture in Korea. You would eat, uh, you know, this much food alone in front of the monitor and you could tune in and um, uh, sort of request certain things, ask questions. But you get this cathartic, very strange fetishism there going on, um, you know, uh, cathartic experience by looking at this person eating a lot of food alone. And you're eating alone as well in front of the monitor and connecting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, oh my God, my people, what's going on in Korea? You know, <laughs> but you do that and you make that connection with that person who's hosting the show, but also other people who are all tuning in, eating alone, going, oh my God, that's so fun. Kind of thing. <laughs> it's an interesting world in which we live. That's right. <laughs> Uh, look, I want to move on to, because we've got a lot to get through, I want to move on to the issue of food security and that whole notion of food security. And, and Tony, maybe if we could start with you on this. Food security, you know, it, it's a concept that's enormously important in many countries of the world. Just simply having enough food, securing enough food for your population mm -hmm. to keep themselves alive. Uh, but what's its real relevance in a nation like Australia, do you think? Uh... Is it relevant to us? I mean, it is re relevant. It depends on what, as you say, there's a, there's a whole range of different um, definitions, I suppose, and levels of food security. Yes, it is an issue in Australia. There's, you know, communities and, and, and parts of society that are struggling to find enough um, nutrients to feed themselves um, for the day. Um, there's no doubt about that. But uh, having said that, we produce enough food in Australia to um, feed about 60 million people. So, um, you know, given our population is a bit over 20... 20 million, we export about two thirds of what we produce. So food security at that level is never, um, well, not never, unless something significant and dram dramatic changes, um, unlikely to be an issue at that level in Australia. Um, when you look globally, uh, you know, if you if you look at some of the predictions around uh, what the food requirements are going to be by 2050, you know, talking about doubling of uh, production, that sort of thing, then we're talking about some serious food security issues. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, to respond to those things, we're going to need significant investment, significant technology uptake to actually um, make sure that we can supply with the resources that we have, um, those, that capacity, that production of food. So for Australian farmers, food uh, security, as it relates to overseas, as it relates to, say, Asia or, uh, or Africa, that's a future issue, though, still, because the amount of food that we're exporting at the moment, that's not for food security, is it? That's for, that's for profit. That's going to the growing middle class, isn't it, in, in Asia particularly? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, it has been, and increasingly so. It will, as you know, markets like China and, and others open up. Um, huge opportunities for farmers here in Australia to continue being more efficient and producing more. Uh, and it's, at that level, it's about economic drivers in, in the rural community and, and for the economy more broadly. And just, I mean, just briefly, I mean, looking to the future, how significant a role could we play then in meeting some of those food security issues that are going to come up, some of those food security needs that are going to come up? Yeah, there's a lot of, um, I mean, we've, we take a fairly conservative view of that, I suppose. We have, yes, we're a large country and yes, we're a large exporter of things like um, wheat and, and beef and dairy products. And, and very like efficient that. producers of those, aren't we? Yeah, very much so. And, and that has, uh, you know, there's been some pain over the last 50 years around restructuring and deregulation of, of different sectors. So, um, you know, the Australian farm sector is very efficient, um, still more work to, work to do, but um, we're efficient producers. But in terms of our capacity to produce and supply some of these growing markets, you look at some of the cities in China, sort of 20 million people um, on their own. So if we have the capacity to feed an extra 40 million outside Australia, um, you know, we're not talking about um, countries, we're probably talking about regions and, and cities and, and maybe provinces um, less than, than countries. So I think we need to put that in perspective that yes, we're, there's lots of opportunities um, and yes, we're a very high quality, 
um, large producer, but we're, in my mind, never going to supply, will we'll be a component of, or a part of the, the, uh, the food security challenge globally, I think. Uh, Carol uh, Richards, somebody's just tweeted, uh, how can the Food Sovereignty Alliance support issues of food security in Australia? That's a you're, fantastic you're question. You're part of the Food Sovereignty Alliance. Oh, is it it's from the Food Sovereignty Alliance? It's like a Dorothy, Alliance, <laughs> like a Dorothy uh, Dick. So. Let's take it up there. I mean, what, what, what does... What does it mean? Somebody else has tweeted here, Mel Kettle's tweeted, food security is relevant to Australia to the thousands of people who are hungry every day, yeah. which is outrageous in this country. Yeah. G give us your definition of what food security means for us in Australia. Wow. Well, that's a, that's a good question, isn't it? I mean, we, we, a lot of people now that are, are working intensely in this field are talking about moving away from the idea of food security to the idea of food sovereignty. Because food security works in, the, I guess, the current kind of neoliberal paradigm about producing more and more food, Chucking away 40% of it because we think it's ugly while we've still got a billion people globally who are hungry. So we've had food security for a long time. It's still not solved the issues of hunger. Um, food sovereignty is a different approach. Food sovereignty is more about uh, the rights to have rights over food, so taking control of the food system, um, you, know, you know, not kind of passively accepting, for example, the corporate concentration of the food system, that the food system is owned by other people and we're just kind of passive subjects in that system. But that's easy so, to say, though, isn't it? But in a, yeah. in a country where the distribution of food, uh, as has been pointed out by many people, is basically a duopoly. You know, yeah. you, you yeah. choose one enormously large supermarket chain or you choose the other. Yep. In that kind of system, what does it mean to be talking about rights and people's sovereignty in reality? Yeah, it means taking control of that system, clawing back some market share, clawing back some rights around food, growing your own, getting involved in farmers' markets, finding alternative outlets for food. I, I mentioned a few organisations before. Um, and, and building on some things that Jazz mentioned about the uh, new technologies, there's something that's just uh, starting up now called the Open Food Network, for example. So this is a, a web-based system that connects farmers with the eaters. So it's shortening the supply chain, cutting out some of the major players who are taking control of the food system and putting the rights and the responsibility back to the people involved in food um, is, is one way of going about that. Josh, I'd like to get your input on this because I know that one of your concerns is that the sheer abundance of food within a country like Australia mm. means that people no longer have to make sustainable choices about the type of food that they buy and eat. Now, why is, why is that a bad thing? Oh, it's... Again, um, it's, yeah, first world issues and, you know, that, that's something that, you know, is a consistent theme to a lot of what we're talking about. And, um, and yeah, no, certainly I, I feel like there's a massive hypocrisy of you know why you know why produce and uh, treat foods um, purely as a as a commodity as how can I leverage my economic wealth on on the back of food and um, and really you know treating food like that is you know defeats the purpose you know I, I like to um, you know I like the way things are shaping towards almost a community based system where not everyone can you know create everything where you know the baker who bakes the bread. Um, you know, he's not out there for, you know, to make millions of dollars. He's there to support his family and do what he do, applying his trade. But, you know, in the terms that, you know, he'd, he may barter the, the food, you know, to leverage other things that, in, that he may not. And so, um, you know, yeah, food security and just really viewing food as money is, is, is a major issue instead of, you know, just sharing and... Um, which food does really, really well. But that sounds, more, that, more that sounds great. It. That sounds great. And, and probably most of us would agree with that. But food is money, isn't mm. it? It is part of, of the economy. It is what, part of what, uh, what makes our, our society continue to function. Uh, so there does need to be a recognition, doesn't there, that, that uh, yes, it still does have an economic place. How do you then balance the two in a, in a society like ours? Oh, well, it's absolutely tricky. It's absolutely tricky. But, um, you know, there, there are amazing uh, companies out there like OzHarvest that, um, that, you know, deal or tackle the issue of, um, you know, the, you know, wastage of food and, you know, d redistribute it to people in need. So, um, you know, it's about, you know, just being more effective and uh, just being more resourceful and, again, not ordering more than what we need. You know, just, you know, making sure that... Um, if we do need a kilo of fish, we just order a kilo of fish and we don't, you know, order too much, I and, guess. And just before we move on, I mean, <coughs> is that difficult for somebody like you, running a, running a restaurant? I mean, how do you deal with people's expectations? In, in a world where we are used to getting the food that we want, yeah. how do you deal with that? How do you, how do you try and 
service their needs, uh, but also kind of get them to moderate their, their behaviour. Oh, no, absolutely. And, and this is the, the whole advocacy as a chef. And, you know, really, it's about returning that connect back to the land. And um, so as a chef, I work really closely with my suppliers to make sure that uh, what I'm serving is ethical or sustainable. And, um, yeah, of course, it has to be economical. I have to, you know, put food on my table. But, um, you know, it's just developing an understanding. And with this uh, empowering of the people, um, they, in turn, can, can go, well, you know, Josh is serving, you know, this type of beef. Where can I buy this type of beef? And then the good suppliers or, you know, the ones making the right decisions will get leveraged instead of Woolworths going, right, we're going to take beef from this supplier who doesn't care about the environment at all only because they can put the mark, you know, put their markups and, and whatnot. And, um, yeah, I'm a firm believer that there's a lot of good people doing amazing things that just don't get to market because they're not... Um, Again, that food's not perfect or but whatnot, but humans aren't perfect either. And uh, I think this whole ideal that, um, you know, as long as the food that we're eating is perfect, then maybe we'll be perfect ourselves is, is a massive hypocrisy. Perhaps so. don't use that humans aren't perfect either <laughs> on your patron in your <laughs> restaurant, I would suggest. Uh, look, uh, somebody's tweeted, as we're concerned about food security, why are we not talking about reducing the world population? And uh, uh, farmers markets are great places to meet producers, buy seasonal food and eat tasty dishes. Any good local examples? Um, I think we've... Have we had an example of a local farmers market? You mentioned one before, I think, didn't you? Or a network, at least. Yeah, Food Connect. Um, Carol knows yeah. them quite well. Maybe you can elaborate on Food Connect. Yeah, F Food Connect is... Um, they, they, were, they were kind of uh, trailblazers in this idea of connecting consumers with farmers. So shortening food supply chains, sourcing locally. I think they source from uh, about a, a five-hour radius of Brisbane. Then you get food that's seasonal, uh, in season at that time. You're, um, if you subscribe to systems like that, then you're supporting local economies as well. Food's very globalised now. Often the food dollars that we spend, particularly in the major supermarket chains, they're going out to shareholders that, you know, who knows where they are in the world. So those kind of systems, like I mentioned before, the Open Food Network as well, that's just setting up um, a whole range of them, farmers, markets, mm. a number of box schemes that source locally, are uh, reconfiguring food systems putting money back in the economy. But I think, as you mentioned before about food, it's inherently economic. And I think we've started to accept this kind of commodification of food. We, we have to start looking at food as a site of resistance as well, now to some of those things, and take control back over the food system and not allow it to be a commodity that's controlled by an ever-decreasing number of people. So you mentioned the supermarket duopoly mm. in Australia. Um, many countries in the Western world have two or three or four supermarkets that hold kind of 90% of the market share. If you think more globally about uh, grains, for example, the trading grains, there's four companies globally that control 90% of our grain. We've put all our eggs in one basket and we've made ourselves really vulnerable in terms of food security with systems like that. The, the other way, Anthony, can sure. I just respond to that? The, the other way of looking at that, and, and you, you're right, there is, there is a, a whole lot of power with a, whole, um, a small amount. But the other way of looking at it um, is that there's been a whole lot of efficiencies in, in that <coughs> process and, and, and in that system. Um, and if, if we are going to have to feed you know, um, another couple of billion people over the next 30 years or so, efficiency, we're going to have to look at efficiency. We're not, we can't, unfortunately, get, all go back to sort of living the subsistence uh, way that we once did, perhaps. So efficiencies and, and you know, scale and, and supply chains and, and those sorts of things are going to have to be part of the solution, I think. So there's, there's a, a balance there. And I'm not saying we've got it right, but I am saying that if we are going to supply all of those pe or millions of people, billions of people, mm. scale but, is But again, it's important. that, I think Carol would say it's that balance. You say it's well, the balance between the two. I'm wondering about, yeah, there's definitely a balance and we do need to produce a volume of food. And I think, you know, we've been dealing with efficiencies probably mostly since the Second World War. So the kind of food system that we have now is a fairly recent food system. You know, bef before that, we basically had an organic food system. When you talk about efficiencies, and it is important, there's a growing global population, but also bearing in mind that we're wasting 40% of our food, you have to think of some of the externalities of those efficiencies. So there are efficiencies, again, for shareholders, um, but the externalities are, you know, there's increasing farm debt in Australia. It's gone up massively in the last two decades. I think it's gone up about 250%. 
Um, there's some of the environmental externalities like uh, biodiversity loss, erosion, salinity, tree clearing and things like that. Mm -hmm. So we have efficiencies, but we also have to um, look at some of the, the pitfalls with those efficiencies too. And on RN and online, this is Goma Talks coming to you from the Gallery of Modern Art in Brisbane. I'm Anthony Fennell from Future Tense. And today's discussion is about food, its security and our future. And just a reminder, our panellists are Tony Ma, General Manager of Policy and Manager of Economics and Trade at the National Farmers Federation, Leading Brisbane Chef Josh Lopez, Dr Jazz Hee-Jong Choi, the Deputy Director of the Urban Informatics Research Lab at QUT, the Queensland University of Technology, and finally Dr Carol Richards, a food and agricultural sociologist, also from QUT, and the Vice President President of the Australian <coughs> Food Sovereignty Alliance. And don't forget, if you want to have your say, you can tweet a comment or a question by using the hashtag #GomaTalks. Um, Tony, just when we're, we're talking about the farming sector, when we when we talk about farmers, I think most of us probably still have in our head uh, family operators, family owned farms. Tell us about the changing nature, though, of the agricultural sector in Australia and how it's going to look into the future. Because, as I understand it, I mean, it is becoming much more about corporate farming, isn't it, than family farming? Uh, yeah, it is. I mean, it, there's no doubt that there's been a shift from the family farm to more corporate farms, and that touches on um, an issue we talked about before, the efficiencies, you know, um, scale and, and the ability to invest, to, uh, to compete globally, because that's what, you know, Australian farmers do, is to compete globally, and Australia is a high-cost producer, and you know, we've got high wage costs, labour rates, uh, energy costs, transport costs, so we're um, an affluent, expensive country to produce goods in when we look at some of the competitors uh, that we're facing. Um, but there is no doubt also that the age, the average age of uh, farmers in Australia is around about 58 and there's a big gap compared to, uh, you know, attracting young people to the industry. So I think there, uh, I think about 99% of the farms in Australia are still family owned um, and that's not it's different to the production cycle. but So there will always be a place for family farms, um, but it will it'll change as people move off the farm. You know, there's not uh, the, the number of children that are staying on the farm these days. They're going off into other, other uh, careers and things like that. So um, it will change, but we, I think there will always be a need for uh, people to come back to agriculture, but it's changing. You know, farms used to employ a whole lot of people. Now with technology and machinery, there's, there's a whole lot less need for, for people to be on farm. So uh, the majority, the overwhelming majority of farms are still family owned, mm -hmm. but what about the big producers uh, within the agricultural sector? I presume they're not family owned businesses. And, and are they really responsible? How much of the agriculture that we produce, how much of the produce that we produce are they responsible for? Yeah, so they're obviously responsible for an increasing um, amount and it differs from, from sector to sector. So broadacre farming or beef and um, dairy and horticulture. So it, it does vary. Um, but I think you'll find that what has happened as we've seen the, the growth of retailers and wholesalers, um, there's the, the whole uh, aggregators in the market. So, you know, mum and dad, um, orange grower in Griffith, for example, would supply to a, a big wholesaler, which would then go to the retailer. Or, in, or in, in fact, if the, that wholesaler is even there, they may well go to the, the retailer themselves. So the, the supply chain is, is shrinking um, as the need for consolidation and scale increases. Uh, Josh, as a, a chef, I know that you, and you've, you've talked about this, a particular focus on trying trying to source your material locally and to, and to support local producers. Uh, but really, for a lot of people, uh, price, cost is going to be a determinant, isn't it? Absolutely. How do you get around that? With, how, do, how do people get around that? Because they may well have intentions, good intentions, that they want to support local producers, but you know, when they get there and they see how much that's going to cost... Um, well, I guess um, I will reference MasterChef. Um, and the reason why I'm doing this is because um, at the moment in, in the restaurant, I run a dish which uses lamb breast. Um, the butchers, they call it as lamb flaps. And uh, essentially, it's um, you know, long been disregarded as a uh, nice bit of meat to eat. But um, you know, given that you know, I am a chef and I have, you know, it is a craft and I have you know, spent a lot of time kind of honing my skills, I've been able to take what is perceived as the inedible and, uh, and value add. So, um, so essentially, you know, where you know, a lot of chefs may not know what to do with a lamb breast, you know, 
I can take something that would be wasted and, uh, in fact, you know, serve a nice dish out of it. Um, so it's about understanding what to do with food. And, uh, and a lot of people, you know, like with Food Connect, you can order a mixed box for, for $50. And, uh, you know, you may get turnips and, uh, and whatnot. But do you know what to do with a turnip? You know, turnips not on, not in the mainstream, but uh, you know, I can tell you that um, by looking at every ingredient and uh, and understanding that uh, each ingredient is special. You know, it's come out of the earth. You know, it's you know had time to mature, and particularly you know this goes back to the farmers that actually care about what they're producing. Um, you know, that food's just going to taste so much better. And um, and this is why I'm referencing MasterChef, where we're now you know in a society where we can almost learn visually off the TV. Sure, not everyone can do that, but at least we can see where, instead of being wasteful and you know just you know I've got my piece of fish, I'm going to just take the fillets, throw throw out all the bones and uh, and whatnot. You can actually create three or four meals using other parts of the fish, and and, uh, and that's going to reduce price essentially. Jazz uh, Hee Jong Choi. Um, what we're talking about there, I guess, and that idea of what do you do with a turnip, I mean, it is really a question around food li literacy, isn't it? I mean, we're used to thinking about people. We, we often talk about people as the consumers of food, as consumers. Mm. They, they buy food and they consume it. What about that, that issue of, of personal responsibility, though, about educating yourself, becoming literate in, in the way food is and the way you should use it? Um, I think it's an interesting area to think about. I think we have to be very careful when we are talking about educating people, making them responsible, that kind of thing. And I think we should, uh, firstly, yes, food literacy is important. And there's a huge um, uh, academic work happening uh, in conjunction with Queensland Health um, at QUT, by, led by Helen Vision and Danielle Gallagher, for example, about food literacy. What is it? You know, um, what is this food? How can I make it edible, and how can I budget so I have enough access to food? For example, you know that is a very complex area of food literacy that everyone should have access to, and have um, a certain level of food lit literacy for sure. Uh, at the same time, I'm very cautious about you know, especially using technology, and that's really sort of common practice as well in sort of you know human computer interaction um, domain of research. How can we change someone's behaviour? How can we make them more responsible for themselves? I think it's a very sort of neoliberal approach as well to sort of expect people you have to be a good citizen and to do so you have to act this way and we are going to use these technologies to <laughs> make sure that you behave that way. Um, so I think we need to, while food literacy is very important and everyone should have certain level of that, we have to be very, very careful about how we perceive it and how we actually you know, operationalise that in uh, everyday lives of people. I presume, too, I suppose there's issues, isn't there, around the sort of information that you're getting access to, mm -hmm. um, where it's coming from, how much of it is actually PR, what the, the motivation behind providing that information to you are to try and help you become food literate. They must be questions that you have to ask yourself as, a, as an individual as well, wouldn't they? Um. Feel free to say no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I... Th I I'm not actually questioning that you don't have to have any responsibilities about questioning. And I think questioning as a citizen is a very important thing, whether you're a researcher or everyday citizen, you have to question things, otherwise, you know, you're just accepting things as they are. And I think we have put in a lot of faith in the government. And in terms of food security as well, and I <laughs> do agree with, um, for example, James C. Scott, when he talks about food sovereignty and food security, it's very interesting. Well, he doesn't like the idea of food sovereignty <laughs> because he can't spell it, apparently. <laughs> 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 you know, so um, he can, um, <laughs> but you know it's difficult to spell. But also um, about giving that thinking, the state uh, having that faith that state has to ensure this security for us. You know, uh, what are we? Do we have no, you know, um, responsibility or capacity to ensure our own for security? Uh, somebody's tweeted, uh, you want to educate people about food, get them to grow their own. It'll be the tastiest they have eaten, uh, it'll be the tastiest they've eaten also. Um, Carol Richards, food literacy within a society, uh, all well and fine, but what about issues about transparency? I guess what I alluded to before, how do you know what's being sold to you as, as real information about food and where it's coming from? Yeah. How do you know what's the PR? Yeah. And then... Uh, I suppose, as well as that, the uh, opaqueness of the, mm -hmm. the various systems that 
are there to that, that are there providing you know the transport systems the information about that where your food is actually how far away your food is coming from yeah it's talk to us about those there's, there's so much going on there isn't there there is a big issue about transparency around food and i've had the luxury of spending the last 10 years of having nothing much to do but research food which makes me really painful to go out with to eat food, but <laughs> but I'll come to oh, your I restaurant. Say the yeah. Same as well. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it, it's really hard when you know. But then most people don't have the luxury of spending a lot of time researching food, and so in the absence of that, what you need are transparent and uh, I was going to say transparent and opaque. That wasn't good. Transparent systems of um, of knowing what's in your food, and one of them is food labelling. But there's a lot of things that are not on the food label, and I can think of many examples. For a, for instance, in Australia, we do have to um, identify when genetic, genetically modified ingredients are in food when they're more than 1% of the ingredient. But then that, doesn't, um, that isn't the case if it's, uh, for instance, meat or livestock that's been fed on genetically modified food. We grow a lot of genetically modified cotton in Australia. The cotton seed from that goes into feeding livestock. So w this is in our food system at the moment, but I don't know how many people are aware of that or whether it would put you off eating things if you think they've been fed with genetically modified ingredients. Another one is, um, we're talking about the beauty of food, this cosmetic appearance of food that we see in supermarkets. They're all beautifully arranged for us. They're all uniform in their appearance. They all weigh the same. They're all a certain percentage of red or green. And if you take them home and sit them on the bench, they, they just don't rot for, you know, for six months or something like that. And I, I know one of the products that's used is something, it's a trademark called Smart Fresh. And this is a, a ripening retardant that uh, food is gassed with. So it stops the ripening process, which makes food last longer. I don't know how many people are aware of those things because it's simply not on the label, and uh, I think it should be. And why, why isn't it on the label, though? I mean, well, is it just a historic thing, or do you think that there are pressures, oh, yeah. pressures at play that uh, actively work to prevent those things being taken yeah. into consideration? If you think of some of the inputs, the companies that are behind some of the agricultural inputs, some of the major chemical companies, for instance, some global transnational companies, they spend billions on lobbying, and... I, good example of that is just recently that the, uh, I mean, we're talking about global food systems here as well, uh, and it's hard not to because we're so mm. globally integrated, but recently in California, the, uh, the Monsanto lab lobby put so much money behind their PR campaign, uh, they actually prevented the uh, labelling of genetically modified foods in that state. A similar fight's going on at the moment in Vermont as well, where the states... So the people that... This is the people actually represent... Uh, elect their representatives... And they're pushing for labelling and transparency in some of these. But then you've got this kind of anonymous transnational body who nobody's elected, who have all of this power to actually uh, stifle those processes, those democratic processes. Uh, Tony Ma from the National Farmers Federation, your thoughts on transparency? Because I can imagine there'd be some issues for you in terms of, in terms of global networks. I imagine a lot of Australian farmers would like people to know that the Oranges they buy don't come from Queensland or wherever they come from in Australia. They, they come from Israel or, uh, you know, somewhere else or California. Yep. So there's that issue. Talk to us about that. But also talk to us about the transparency regarding Australian produce and, and, and the Australians who buy that produce. Yeah, um, that, that's true. The, um, we think that the, the labelling laws um, are confusing and aren't clear enough and, and don't give uh, the provenance of food uh, or isn't clear enough for consumers to actually make those informed decisions. And you'll, you know, go into supermarkets and you see these um, very, very orange oranges from California. And, and it's, uh, it's not necessarily in fine print, but it's there that they are a product of the USA or, um, uh, or somewhere else. So we think that there needs to be more government regulation in that area to make it clearer and, and you know, demand retailers... Uh, be clear about the, the labelling. Um, I mean, that, that is a complex issue. I mean, we could spend a, an, an hour talking about ingredients and sourcing and, and all of those sorts of things, but there is something that needs to be done there. Um, the other issue, I suppose, that I just wanted to touch on was the issue around transparency and what, you know, um, multinational companies, and, and I'm not here to defend Monsanto um, for a second, but 
we, we touched on earlier in the conversation about, you know, the amount of food that goes uh, to waste and, you know, use by dates and best befores and all, all that sort of thing. Um, some of these measures, and, and you're right, big multinational companies and some of them are chemical companies and some of them are food companies, spend millions and millions of dollars trying to extend the life of food and make it um, healthier and make it tastier and, and make it uh, better for the consumer. So adding nutrients so it's low fat or low sugar or low salt or... Um, you just need to look at the, the aisles of the milk aisle, how many varieties of milk are there at the moment. Um, so there is again that balance between the food supply chain doing the right thing and you know, um, wrapping, for example, everyone would have uh, experienced the cucumbers wrapped in, in glad wrap and people ask, for God's sake, why is, An is a cucumber... Annoyingly wrapped in glad wrap, <laughs> and, I have to say. And, you know, and, and the people that wrap them in the glad wrap will say because they keep, and be, you get them home and they keep for a, a week longer than the, and they might normally. So I'm not saying there's right or wrong, but there is, as ever, two sides to every story, and those companies and the transparency, I think, needs to be improved, but some of the work they're doing is in response to consumer demands. Carol, your response? Vested interests, say <laughs> two words. Uh, well, it's easy for us to think it's in response to consumer demands when they're the major voice that we hear. I mean, it's, we don't have a choice. We don't really know what we're demanding because we don't know what's on the label. We don't have a choice to buy from, um, you know, 25 different supermarkets. So a, a, a lot of the, the, the choice has been taken away from us. And, and replaced with this idea, and I think that's a PR campaign in itself, is uh, you know, the, the fact that we have these perfectly uniform apples in the supermarket is due to consumer demand. I don't know how much that is. I mean, how is one super... If you've only got two supermarkets, one of them's not going to start selling ugly fruit while the other one doesn't. So mm. it's not about consumer demand, it's about market competition, market share, and value for shareholders. Uh, Jazz, your thoughts on transparency? Um, obviously, transparency and uh, data and, you know... Um, it's an obvious link, and we can think of, uh, you know, um, uh, we could trace. Uh, there, there was a project run by uh, my colleague at Oxford um, about sort of tracking where certain things come from and every step of the way. And I think, um, as you said, you know, there are multi. It's a multi-dimensional issue, and what people want to know and what uh, producers could provide, what sort of information they could provide as well. And, you know, um, we can't... I think we're making a lot of demands to uh, farmers, if you talk about sort of, you know, organic produce. We can't keep asking farmers to do everything, you know, and I just sort of run into it um, every time in my field of research, which is sort of design and human-computer interaction. <laughs> it's sort of like, yeah, guess what? We can make an, an, an app, and this is coming from students, researchers, professors, doesn't matter. We can make an app that could connect you to farmers and the farmers could help you with questions and you know they can help you with questions about how to grow things uh, really i mean I, I think farmers are very very busy people and th there are <laughs> there are a lot of things that they do to make sure that you get that food on the table um, and to make sure that they make enough profit to survive you know um, so <laughs> I think I just went sideways. No, 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 but a very good point. And, I mean, I guess it's about being realistic, isn't it, about yeah, those right. kind of connections that we build. Uh, look, we're fast running out of time, but there are a couple of issues that I, I, I do want to cover in tonight's programme. One of them is urban farming. Mm -hmm. And, and Jazz, let's stay with you on that because, you know, it's popular now to talk about the rise of urban farming. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure most people in this audience would think urban farming is a, is a terrific thing. And in many ways, it's a return to what used to happen not so long ago where yep. people had backyard plots where they grew vegetables. You know, in London, famously, uh, you know, people had plots, uh, communal plots, mm. where they could grow produce. There are, I know, a lot of really interesting urban farming initiatives going on. We covered one on Future Tense recently where they were developing a, a hydroponic farm in an old World War II shelter underneath, the, right in the centre of London, uh -huh. uh, you know, and growing vegetables for local uh, restaurants. That's all well and good, that's great. But what really, how can that scale up? Can that scale up? How important is urban farming ever really going to be in terms of meeting our food needs? I think it's crucial that we actually support urban farming as well. Um, and there are different ways that, uh, I think someone actually asked about vertical farming too, and I think that's a very important step that we need to take, especially as the density of um, urban environment is to sort of, you know, rapidly growing, we really need to think about how we could make sure that we produce food within that environment. Just to let me jump in there, for people who aren't familiar with the term vertical farming, it means 
actually growing, far, uh, actually farming in high-rise towers, so mm -hmm. growing on layers rather than spreading out across the, mm -hmm. uh, across the land. That's so right. And other, other um, parts of um, urban environments, underused areas, um, you know, and also rooftop farming, that's all happening. And I think very important thing, um, a movement that I think is really positive and we really need to support is social entrepreneurs. You know, um, so there's a, a honey producer in Brisbane as well. Um, B1 third. Yeah. B1 third, that's it. Um, so, you know, using they'll, this... They'll be thankful for that plug. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Um, <laughs> um, so, users of those very tiny spaces as well, rooftop, what do you do there, you know? Um, and also, I am familiar with um, young people in South Korea, in Seoul, in fact, where, you, you know, this much space would cost you a, a lot of money um, in Seoul because of the density. Um, you know, uh, the mayor of Seoul kindly donated or gave um, the block of land in the middle of the Han River, which is sort of like Brisbane River, in the central mm -hmm. Seoul, um, to this uh, group of pe young people who are interested in urban agriculture. And they could actually use that space to produce organic food and deliver them to restaurants. And they actually make profit, you know, by doing that. And that actually teaches young people as well, you know, being green and actually going into agriculture is a viable solution for your career. And that's also happening in China too, isn't it? I'm mm, aware everywhere. of of various projects where uh, Chinese muni municipalities are building in urban farming initiatives into their into their urban planning for the future, into mm -hmm. the way they're designing uh, new city centres and uh, I even into the way they're designing suburbs. So mm -hmm. factoring that in along with the the roads and the bridges and and all of the other infrastructure. Um, that needs to be there. Josh, as a, as a chef, uh, how, what does urban farming mean to you though? And what are some of the, what are some of the difficulties, uh, particularly around regulations with, say, somebody like you being able to use the produce that's grown within a city? Yeah, well, um, for me, urban farming um, is, um, interestingly, can be brought down into urban foraging where, um, you know, I feel like the, like, you know, our grandparents, you know, knew, like, you know, wood sorrel, which grows pretty much everywhere as uh, soursop. And essentially, you know, there's been a massive, um, well, people have just forgotten what you can eat. And uh, there's so many edible things in the ground currently right now that we could eat, but choose not to. And, um, and so I think, you know, there's, you know, we can supplement our, our kitchen tables with, you know, edible plants that already grow in, in our lawns, essentially. But, but, but for somebody like you who runs a restaurant, mm. are you allowed to use that? Uh, are there restrictions well, on well, the, the sorts of produce that you can use in your restaurant? Yeah, d definitely. Um, you know, you should only buy from accredited or reputable, you know, you know sources and things like that. Um, but the, the hypocrisy and about these that These are health regulations. These are not just your personal... No, 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 exactly. You know, there has to be that transparency that, um, you know, just in case someone does get sick, you know where the, the traceability is so you can blame someone, essentially. But, but, but you can... You but know, that also has to be a good thing. If, I mean, you don't... Oh, none of us want to get sick. No, 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 not at all. But uh, interestingly, you know, we can grow whatever we want at home with no regulations or, or anything and just put anything we want in in their mouths and um, you know, I haven't heard of many people dying from growing you know, beans at home. So, so you know, it's interesting and um, yeah, there's a few implications that, that just make things difficult and uh, this all references again that um, good producers not being able to make it to market because they don't have accreditation. And um, yeah, I think there's pros and cons definitely. Now let's stay with you and, uh, and tell me about the slow food movement and, and particularly, I mean, most people would be familiar with the slow food movement to an extent. Yeah. Uh, tell us about the Nordic Food Manifesto um, and also about the Australian Manifesto, your project that you're trying to, to get up and go. Let's start with the Nordic one. What's, what's yep. that all about? So in 2004, uh, a gentleman by the name of Klaus Meyer um, grabbed 12 um, prominent chefs of Scandinavia and uh, they, they signed a, uh, a manifesto which uh, stipulated that we promised to use local ingredients which reference our culture our history and, uh, and also our future. And, uh, and by doing so, um, what many people deem to be issues of, uh, you know, because France at the time really dictated, uh, you know, the global food trends and whatnot, um, you know, instead of seeing that as an issue, they've really empowered themselves and uh, have now created a food movement which is actually the strongest in the world. 
Um, Rene Redzepi of Noma, a restaurant which I've trained, um, they've been awarded uh, World's Best Restaurant four times in a row. But I can tell you in 2004, when they all sat down together and you know, devised and promised to do these things, I can imagine that um, though they probably thought um, they would you know, be able to achieve something to create um, you know, the world's best restaurant in the world you know, four times is, is huge. Mm -hmm. And so this goes on to the Australian Food Manifesto, which is, again, um, it's, a, it's all about regionality. And uh, I saw a question before referencing native produce. Um, again, another example where, where Woolworths hasn't really picked up the baton, but ironically, Heston Blumenthal can make pies with, with like bush, bush wattle and, and, and things like lemon myrtle, um, Easter buns and, and things like that. So why is a British chef coming over here to teach us how to utilise, you know, what, um, what really, you know, is, is available around us? Just some final quick, quick questions. Carol Richards, the, the previous Labor federal government uh, put forward a national food plan uh, now, I know that you believe that it was, a, it was actually a flawed plan. Yeah. What was essentially wrong with it from your perspective? It was a national food plan that favoured major corporations. If you have a look, this is me beating the same drum, but if you have a look at actually the steering committee that, um, that, that was in, you know, in, in charge of that food plan, it was big corporations. There was, uh, I know the National Farmers Federation was on that committee, but there was nobody from civil society, nobody from public health, nobody from education, uh, no local community food network. So it was really geared to the top end of town, mm. big business food systems. So it was quite lacking in that way. And um, this is probably really the one single event that kick-started the Australian Food Sovereignty Alliance, because we looked at that and we thought, you know, do, do, we, do we put in a submission, which we did, we put in a submission and, and you know, made our views known about that. But we decided also to to um, just, just to meet, to actually have a grassroots food system. So we wrote something that we called the People's Food Plan that we crowdsourced. We, we used networks of volunteers. We spoke to about 600 people. Uh, we, we brought all that information together and we designed Australia's first crowdsourced food policy document, which is a live document that's in circulation now. So and, and so that's out there now? for That's out there now on the website, yeah, on the Food Sovereignty Alliance website. Um. All right. Uh, Tony Ma from the National Farmers Federation. New technologies. Mm -hmm. um, I saw recently, or about a year ago, I, I, somebody showed me a, a top, top of the range, state of the art Dutch robotic milking machine. <laughs> I know that sounds odd. It was unbelievably impressive. Mm -hmm. It not only milked the cow, it also took the, the cow's blood pressure, heat, it tested the milk at the same time for impurities, for fat content, all of those kinds of things. Yep. That's all great. That's the Dutch doing that. Uh, are Australian companies, uh, Australian researchers doing that kind of work into agricultural technology as well? They are, but not enough. Um, you know, they, we need to do more of that. Uh, we, we have improved a lot, um, but we don't have the, the resources, I suppose. Um, and it's changing, and that's why we need you know, more domestic investment and foreign investment, because uh, the Australian economy uh, doesn't have the capacity really to to beef up uh, agricultural technology and, and, you know, government winding back funding for R&D bodies and, and CSIRO and these sorts of things doesn't help either. So um, if we are going to, as I said before, if we're going to take advantage of these, everyone keeps saying these opportunities in, in Asia and elsewhere, mm. it's going to need a lot more investment in R&D, um, but also investment across the supply chain infrastructure and, and others. But I mean, Australia is doing it, but slowly. Uh, Jazz He Jong Choi, uh, you work with technology. That's your. That's where you are, uh, and looking at the urban environment, and as we know, with uh, with farming. What's next for you? What sort of what sort of projects do you have on the drawing board that you want to get into? What's the focus for you? Right, um, social entrepreneurship definitely um, in developing countries in particular. Uh, because their urbanisation process is a, a lot uh, more rapid, for example, Latin America and, and, and Asia Pacific. Uh, also, I am very interested in sort of, you know, um, self-care and mutual aid. And we talk about food and, you know, there are... Yes, I agree with you. I think we need a lot, of more, a lot more investment in the R&D of agriculture, but also about... I think we talked a lot about sort of needs-based um, approaches to food. You know, we need to do this and we need to do that. And... I think we also equally need to look at desires, and food is a desideratum, and it's as much needed as it is um, desired. So, you know, in terms of design, um, also, you know, what kind of experiences are we trying to make when people, and I think Josh would agree, you know, materiality of food, but also sensorial experiences, um, 
for example, Heston Blumenthal also works with Charles Spence at Oxford University, um, you know, listening to waves while eating oyster, for example, um, actually improves uh, the taste that you, you know, um, recognize in your head. It's sort of, oh, it tastes much better when there are sounds of waves. Um, also, the really soggy chips or crisps, as You work in it. a very interesting field. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's right, you know, um, but I think we need to think about it. Why do people not eat something? Why do people eat certain things? In what way? And we don't really go into those granular sensorial experiences. The essence so we of desire. Should, yeah, exactly. Uh, and Josh, let's end with you. Let's go back to where we, we began with you. Let's end with you. Somebody's tweeted, I think Josh is talking the rhetoric which master chefs need to talk more. Good on you, Josh. Mm -hmm. It's not just about the bottom line. Uh, I want to end with your feature dish for tonight's Goma Talks. As I understand it, you tell us the story, but you've prepared and you've thought about and prepared a separate dish for each of these three Goma Talks in the series, haven't you? Tell us, tell us about that and the one you've <coughs> chosen for tonight, prepared for tonight. Yeah, so, um, yeah, like, um, yeah, for me, I've got to, uh, well, I feel a, a massive sense of, uh, you know, really being the executive chef at the art gallery, making the food respond to, to the art. And, uh, and again, we're gathered here because of the harvest, uh, harvest exhibition. And, uh, and one of the, the themes on that is, uh, you know, food futures. And so I managed, oh, I decided to focus on the subject of rice and how two, mil two billion people depend on it daily and uh, in the un uh, unsustainable practices, in particularly in energy and resources uh, that are used to create it. And also rice being a grass, it actually doesn't do much. It really just saps all the nutrition out of the soil. So instead of using rice, I've decided to use um, three different types of legumes. Uh, we've got uh, mung beans, uh, two types of lentils, red and green, and also chickpeas. So these are all sprouting. And, uh, and sprouted food means that it's uh, activated, or it means it's, it's full of nutrition. So essentially, it's alive. And so we, we treat them really gently, and we serve them um, really quickly. So we coated these, uh, these mung beans in, uh, in broad bean puree, and uh, it, yeah. The reason why I'm referencing the, the rice is because uh, legumes actually fix nitrogen to the soil and, uh, and actually give back and uh, are really beneficial to other plants growing around it. And, um, and so, yeah, we've got the broad bean puree and then we also have uh, rabbit ham. So, you know, a lot of people don't know that, you know, or don't appreciate rabbit, but um, essentially a rabbit can metabolise <laughs> six times or convert six times more protein from the, the same amount of food th than a cow. And, uh, and similarly, we should be eating more of it. Um, well, <laughs> it goes without saying there's two billion of them in the red center, you know? <laughs> so, um, you know, there's plenty of rabbits, you know, they reproduce a lot fast, but they're really efficient. And so um, we take the tenderloins, coat them in, uh, in salt and uh, hit them with vinegar and essentially create our own rabbit ham. So again, you know, securing our future. And if we don't change our ways, we won't have anything else to eat but the dish that I created tonight. So, uh, <laughs> and so I hope you like it or get used to it. So. <laughs> I have to. I have to say I work for the ABC, so I'm not meant to favour any product, you know, product or company, I suppose. <laughs> but I did try it earlier before this, and I can tell you, it's not only ethical and sustainable; it's also yummy. <laughs> it was very nice indeed. And look, unfortunately, that's where we'll have to leave this game of talks discussion here at the Gallery of Modern Art in Brisbane. Today's panel session has been held in conjunction with the exhibition Harvest, Art, Film and Food. And our panellists were Dr Carol Richards, a Brisbane-based food and agricult agricultural sociologist, Tony Ma, the General Manager of Policy and Manager of Economics and Trade at the National Farmers Federation, QA Goma's Executive Chef, Josh Lopez, and finally Dr Jazz Hee-Jong Choi, the Deputy Director of the Urban Informatics Research Lab at QUT, the Queensland University of Technology, and join me in giving them a round of applause. <laughs> now, before we, we part, we go and, uh, and some of you try and get, some, get hold of some uh, risotto. Um, a reminder that tonight's Goma Talks discussion is the first of three events being co-presented co by ABC Radio National and QA Goma during the Harvest Exhibition. I encourage you to come back uh, to both of the upcoming ones. The first will be, or the second in the series, will be on Thursday the 17th of July with my colleague Sarah Kanowski from RN's Weekend Arts Program. And Sarah and her guests will be exploring food, art and life, the vital role food has always played in shaping our cultural identities. 
And the final event on Thursday the 31st of July will be with Paul Barclay from Big Ideas. And he'll be examining the politics surrounding contemporary food, uh, food culture, drawing on debates over food labelling, junk food, dieting and more. Tonight's GOMA Talks will be available online at QA GOMA's uh, TV uh, through the gallery's website. It will also air on my program Future Tense, which broadcasts every Sunday morning at 11.30 and every Thursday afternoon at 2.30 on RN. I'm allowed to plug myself. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, this will be on... Uh, uh, half an hour of this will be on uh, this Sunday's... this coming Sunday's program. So, that's it. Thanks to everybody who watched us via the live webcast tonight and thanks to everybody else who joined us and, and sent in questions from Twitter. So, on behalf of GOMA and also Radio National, I'm Anthony Fennell. Thank you and good night. Thank you.